we are on the cloud. I'm going to Facebook. Right. And when do I go live? I believe I'm going to spotlight you. Oh, I don't even know what that means. So that means you're the only one on the video right now. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going on Facebook. We are currently broadcasting. We are live. We have growing numbers of people. Are we live live? We are live live. Yes, sir. Okay. Hello, everybody. <laughs> We'd like to uh, welcome you all to the 2020 Psilocybin Summit. We are getting everybody together here. I believe we'll go ahead and we'll wait for the, I think the number most people have been saying is about um, 200, 250, and then we can go ahead and get going. I'm going live on Facebook right now. Hope everyone is well, welcome from Australia. We have, we have, looks like a Hawaii with the Aloha, smoky Seattle, Oakland, California. Welcome Matt, Karen and Shasta. From the Berkshires, uh, Julian from the Berkshires. Interesting. A lot of California folk, Aurora, Colorado bird. Welcome. Welcome everyone. Everything's looking good so far. Oh, wow. Yeah, the chat is really ticking over. Mm -hmm. It's going strong. We're already at 101 people. Well, we are going to go ahead and I think start here just to make sure we have enough time. Um, I would like to welcome you all to another one of our wonderful talks. Today, we are welcomed by the irreplaceable and always charming Kane Barlow. Um, we are going to be talking today about Australian bush. Um, as well, the uh, specific species found there, as well as Australian New Zealand Psilocybe species. Um, I would like to give you an introduction to who Kane is. Um, he is a fungi educator who has been cultivating and studying fungi for over 14 years. Um, last year in 2019, he completed his master's degree in where his research project was to predict a preliminary conservation status for many Australian fungi. From there, um, when he's not growing fungi, he volunteers his time with Entheogenesis Australis, Myco Community, Applied Mycology, and the Australian Psychedelic Society. He's written some wonderful uh, pieces for Double Blind, who is also presenting here this weekend, and is a regular contributor to and trusted identifier and administrator on a variety of different fungi-oriented website forums and Facebook groups. Um, he has an Instagram account, Gorilla Mycology. Feel free to follow him there, where he also blogs about his cultivation techniques and ethnomycology of fungi he finds in the field. And if you haven't seen some of his pictures and stories, they're really worth checking out. Kane, thank you very much for coming today. Cheers. Thank you very much, Anne. And hello, everybody. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen. So you're going to have to excuse me for a minute while I work this out. Okay, is that good, Ian? Yes, sir. Cool. I'm going to start with an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm speaking, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I also acknowledge the custodians of plant and fungi knowledge who have passed down their wisdom to us from times long gone. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And I would like to extend my acknowledgement out to where everyone is joining from. Thank you very much. So my talk today is Aussie bush subs and the Wiraroa pouch fungus, the psilocybe species of Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so Ian help is helping today, he's moderating and um, He'll be choosing questions to ask at the end. 
So a brief overview. I'm going to start with a few quick notes on psilocybe taxonomy. I'm then going to discuss some uh, facts about climate and habitat of Australia and New Zealand, interspersed amongst the Australian species and New Zealand species, cover a couple of introduced species, and then launch into the Australian species and then the New Zealand species. I'd like to point out, I'm probably going to use some, I am going to use some abbreviations throughout this talk. So for example, NZ is New Zealand, TAS for Tasmania, Vic, Victoria, etc. So hopefully everyone can uh, stay on board with those. Uh, I'm also going to introduce some mushroom features for taxonomy. So this talk is going to be a little bit taxonomy heavy. I do use a lot of taxonomical words. Uh, so keep in mind that this is also being recorded so you can come back later and, um, and review some of these slides and, and what I am discussing. One of the great features of, um, one of the important features is, is of psilocybe is, is the umbo. It's this little nipple-like structure at the top. Uh, then we have the cap itself, which is, uh, the technical term is pileus. Uh, we then have veil remnants. So these are these features around the cap here and around. Can you see my mouse? Ian, when I move my, okay. Um, yeah, so the veil remnants around the edge of the cap here. We have the gills, referred to as the lamellae. Uh, we also have, many psilocybe have a partial veil, which peels down off the cap as the cap emerges. If I go back a slide, this psilocybe subarachnoidsa, for example, you can see the, the partial veil. The cap is pushing up through it and it's peeling down. Uh, we have the stem, otherwise referred to as the stipe. And of course, we have the mycelium. Common features of psilocybe. I'm covering these now in order to make my slides a little bit less text heavy. Uh, and so I can skip over a few features. Uh, but essentially a lot of psilocybe are little brown mushrooms. Other than say psilocybe cubensis, which is quite a big mushroom uh, and can be seen from quite a distance away. A lot of them are, are tiny little brown things that kind of just emerge from from leaf litter or the soil. Uh, they're usually solitary to gregarious. So you find them individually or in or little groups. You rarely find them in, in distinct clusters. Uh, all psilocybe bruise blue on the cap, stem and gills to varying degrees. Psilocybe subarachnosa or psilocybe azurescens, for example, bruise really heavily. They have a very strong blue color sometimes. Uh, whereas Semilanciata uh, it will only really blue just a little bit on the base of the stem. Uh, pretty much all the psilocybes I'm talking about today have a purple black spore print but some species do have a lighter, lighter brown print. Uh, it's fairly common that they all have a smooth hygrophonous cap. Uh, this is uh, often smooth and shiny, uh, moist looking. Uh, as the hygrophonous cap dries out, the, the caps change colour, often to a light brown or a yellow. Uh, in some cases they take on a little bit of a gold tint, hence the name uh, golden caps. So it'll also be itself means bareheaded and this refers to the separable pellicle. It's a thin gelatinous layer that is over the top of the cap and in my next slide I will illustrate that. Many field guides still contain non-bruising psilocybe species. Uh, likely many of these have been or are going to be moved to other genera such as Deconica species and a variety of others. Uh, there's only one or two psilocybe species that, that have lost the ability to produce psilocybin and hence that bluing feature. This is the separable pellicle. You can snap the cap very gently, peel it back a bit and you'll get that, that little gelatinous layer. It's quite a distinctive feature of, of many psilocybe. Uh, so when talking about climate zones, uh, so Australia, for example, is a mostly arid and semi-arid country. Uh, but down in southeast Australia, so 
uh, from New South Wales down through Victoria and Tasmania, and then New Zealand, we have an oceanic climate. Uh, on this chart, it's referred to as marine west coast. Uh, marine west coast is also occurs at the Pacific Northwest of Northern America. Uh, so those of you from there who are familiar with uh, Azurescens, for example, or Cyanescens, will be familiar with that, with that climate zone. The, from the western part of Victoria up through South Australia and into Western Australia, uh, it's a Mediterranean climate. Um, so one of the important aspects here is, is that uh, the heavy dews of the oceanic climate really help to moisten the substrate and allow these fungi to fruit earlier in seasons. Whereas the Mediterranean climate, they need a lot more rain before, before the climate begins. It's a very dry climate. And then further up the coast, we have the humid subtropical uh, and then, and then um, tropical wet and dry. Uh, to illustrate in a little bit more detail in Australia, we have, so we have the temperate zones, uh, subtropical and tropical zones. This can be mirrored through, for example, in Tasmania, you have temperate rainforest and sclerophyll forest. Sclerophyll forest follows that oceanic zone up along the coast. Uh, and then as you get to northern New South Wales and Queensland, you start to see the beginnings of tropical rainforest. Uh, and then there's also a little bit of other extra temperate rainforest with some pockets of Gondwan and forest left. Uh, so to illustrate some of the forest types, very briefly, this is wet sclerophyll forest. Uh, it's dominated by eucalyptus, acacia, maybe some bedfordias and, and, some, and manthans, uh, Antarctica dixonii. Uh, this is an extreme case of dry sclerophyll. There's lots of debris on the ground, lots of sticks, leaves, bark. Uh, this would be taken in the middle of summer, but come winter, this could be quite wet uh, and proves to be a very good substrate for many wood-loving fungi, including Solospia sebericinosa. Uh, this is temperate rainforest. Uh, this is dominated by Nothophagus, so southern beech, uh, Antarctica dixonii, again, man burns. Southern Sassafras, which is Atherosperma, um, and what's another one? Myrtle, lots of myrtles. Uh, and this is the forest floor in a temperate rainforest. Again, you can see lots of loose leafy debris, uh, sticks, bark. Uh, you might find the odd eucalyptus, which, which are very slow to decompose. Okay, let's skip into introduced species. Uh, so in Australia the, and New Zealand, the introduced species are Solosby commensis and Solosby semilanciata. Associated fungus are Paniolus cyanesens and Paniolus cinculus. I'm not covering the Paniolus in this particular talk, but they are active. Uh, given the global spore trading that of other species, it is expected that there are other species present. Uh, for example, azurescens are known to occur, uh, but usually under cultivation and, and are not known yet to have escaped into the wild. Uh, this is the all familiar Solospi cubensis. It grows in open grassland, usually growing from cow pies. Uh, it requires rain and humid conditions. So in Australia, it occurs in Queensland, northern New South Wales, likely in Northern Territory and Northern WA, but we don't see many records on the, on the Facebook groups. The season is usually from November to February during those summer rains. Uh, given how familiar we are, I'm just gonna cover this briefly, but the cap is convex, conic to convex. The cap, uh, it has a distinct umbo. It's usually red and brown when young. The gill attachments are adnate to adnext, close. Um, and the gills tend to be pallid to grey, uh, dark purple to black in age. The stem is usually white, and as they age, they turn a yellowish colour. One of the distinctive features is that persistent annulus on the stem. 
Uh, the other introduced species is Silosby similanciata, again from open grasslands. It requires cold and heavy dew growing on decomposing grass. Found in Tasmania, Victoria, and New Zealand. Uh, Typic, it's from a Guzman monograph, it's known to occur in mountains, uh, but it does actually occur very close to sea level. This particular photograph was taken from Bruny Island in Tasmania, um, perhaps, yeah, a couple of metres above sea level. Uh, the season is from March to May and then August to October. They don't tend to grow during that very cold period in the middle of winter. Uh, the cap is about five to 25 millimetres wide. It's sharply conical, bell-shaped. It has that prominent little papilla, that little nipple feature at the top. It's, it's very distinctive. So this feature here, and if I go back, uh, you can see it here. The gills through attachment is narrowly adnexed to almost free. The stem, 45 to 140 millimetres tall and slender, white to yellowish brown and quite fibrous. These are really strong stems. You can, you can almost twist it around your finger and that's a really good determining feature of this species. Um, Paniolus, for example, will typically, typically break when you, when you twist it. So genus solus will be from Australia. So we have subtropical and tropical species. These are Solosophy capensis, Solosophy papuana, Solosophy tasmaniana. Temperate, Solosophy seberiginosa, Solosophy alutacea, and Solosophy semilanciata. This is Solosophy papuana. Uh, not very well known in Australia up until a few years ago uh, when it was found in northern New South Wales. It was originally described by Guzman and Hore uh, from specimens found in Papua New Guinea. Uh, it typically, typically grows on soil and among litter, so, and within soil humus. Uh, it's tropical or, it grows in tropical or subtropical montane forest season, April, May, but that's probably up for a further examination. The cat tend to 20 millimetres wide, conical to conico convex, uh, black green to deep olive green, as you can see in this photo. It's a beautiful colour. Uh, the gills, the attachment is adnexed or adnato adnexed. They're densely crowded and they stain a greenish when, when bruised, which is not typical for a cellar The stem, 35 to 55 millimetres tall, the stems are hollow. Uh, you have white fibrils from the veil occurring on the stem. Uh, the base often has white mycelium or white short rhizoids. And again, the, the stem turns green when bruised. Uh, so these are some small specimens within, within the substrate. Uh, you can see the rhizoids here, mycelium stretching through the soil and the leaf litter. Uh, this is Solosby tasmaniana. Its habitat is open forest, usually growing on dung or dung enriched debris. It occurs in New Zealand, New South Wales, Queensland, and New Zealand. Uh, the season, again, probably April to May, but I think um, probably need a bit more information there. Uh, New Zealand pickers probably know a lot more information about its season. The cap is one to two centimetres wide, convex to subcampanulate. Uh, they are distinctively striate near the margin, as you can see in those photos. Uh, the margin sometimes adorned with whitish remnants from the veil. Uh, they're a tawny orange brown in colour, fading to dull straw colour. Uh, the gill attachment is adnate. The stem is 40 to 65 millimetres tall. Uh, the surface of the stem is silky fibrillose. Um, the flesh, like other psilocybe, bruised blue when injured, especially at the base. Uh, they have a partial veil white, which is soon disappearing. Uh, this is psilocybe alotasia. Um, 
originally found and described in Tasmania, um, but now is more well known from occurring in, in Victoria and parts of South Australia uh, and down the very south of New Zealand. Uh, it grows in wet and dry eucalypt forest, uh, growing off animal dung, typically wombat or, or wombat or wallaby scat. So uh, season is March through to July. Although I seem to recall there might've been one that happened in February of this year. We had an amazing fungi season here in Australia this year and things started a lot earlier than normal. Uh, so the cap is approximately 13 millimetres wide, conical to convex, uh, striate, leathery brown to ochraceous brown in colour. The gills have an adnate attachment and the grey grayish brown in colour. Uh, they're 46 millimetres tall on average um, with a white to pale brown stem. Uh, and this is a specimen next to one of our five cent pieces. Okay, Solosby siberiginosa. Uh, as many of you might have been able to tell already, this is my favourite species uh, and the one that is, is the most common here in Australia, or well, Southeast Australia anyway. Uh, it's synonymous with Solosby australiana and Solosby eucalypta. Uh, so those of you who know uh, psilocybin mushrooms of the world by stamets, uh, would have been aware of these as separate species, but in 1992, they were combined into Sibera Ganosa by Chang and Mills. Uh, this has become a bit of a, an issue for debate, and there's lots of people who would like to review this particular species uh, to see if there's actually, uh, they're still valid species. Their habitat is wet and dry eucalypt forest, uh, sometimes into rain, rainforest. They, their main substrate is eucalyptus debris, but they are found quite often in pine plantations as well. Uh, they have also escaped into urban areas and found quite often within wood chip garden beds. Uh, so they do have the potential to become quite weedy if, if possible. Uh, they're quite common around universities for some strange reason, I'm, I'm not sure why. Uh, so they found from Tasmania, Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia, Southwest WA, where they're an introduced species, Southeast Queensland, where they seem to also be creeping, their range is growing, uh, and they're also found in New Zealand. They require cold fruit, uh, in the same way that Psilocybe azurecens need cold, so does Psilocybe sabaraginosa. They require a, a few nights of consistently below five to six degrees C. Uh, sorry, I just realized I don't have the Fahrenheit for the United States. Um, their typical season is from April, May to June, July, based on climate. Um, that can stretch out through to even August or September in some locations. Uh, and I personally have found them, for example, in mid-March in Tasmania. Again, it comes back to that what I was talking about with the oceanic climate versus the Mediterranean climate. Uh, the oceanic climate allows the substrate to moisten early, uh, whereas the Mediterranean, they, it needs that heavy rain to really trigger these to fruit. The cap is one to six centimetres wide, beautiful caramel brown colour, uh, drying to yellow, conical, convex, uplifting in age, and they have this, this prominent uh, the attachment is adnate to adnext stem, 4.5 to 22 centimetres. These can be really tall. Sometimes they have to grow up through really thick grass, so they, they really do develop some amazingly long stems. Uh, the stems are firm, white, fibrous. Uh, they turn grey with age and they turn brown with heavy water logging. Uh, they have a a uh, white partial veil that disappears or leaves a trace. You can see, for example, in this specimen that has this really distinct uh, partial veil remnant. Uh, and I think in some of the other photos I'm about to show, you'll, you'll see the ring. Oh, one of the early ones I had in my presentation, for example. These brews really strongly blue. 
like amazingly blue. Uh, so here you can see the partial veil remnants and you can see spores left on the edge here. It's this distinct umbo. Uh, in these photos, you can, again, you can see the spores on the partial veil, uh, that distinct umbo, beautiful kind of yellowy, slightly brown color. Uh, and here in this specimen, you can see why so many Australians will maybe, yeah, and possibly still, but 10 or 20 years ago, would confuse these with Solos Vizionisans because of this kind of undulating margin. Uh, here's a cluster in the wild. So this would be normally like dry sclerophyll, but uh, this is the middle of winter, so it's grassed up a little bit. Um, it's beautiful here, the distinct umbos. This whole log is essentially colonized with suburbanosa. If you break it open, it's just full of mycelium. And when the mycelium hits the soil, that's when the, the primordia trigger and, and the fruits start to grow. I mentioned earlier about clusters. Uh, this is a case where you can get strong clustering like in urban wood chip beds or really well chipped gardens. They'll grow in these really tight clusters and um, not an ordinary feature of any psilocybe. I'm going to briefly mention at this point wood lover paralysis. Uh, wood lover paralysis uh, is a physiological effect. Uh, it's a loss of muscle control. Uh, it's not to be confused with having a really strong dose. You might have had a strong dose and you're unable to move, but that's maybe just because it's, wow, <laughs> everything's a little bit overwhelming. Um, but a few theories, there are a few theories, but the most prominent theory is that Eric Guinnesson is the culprit. So for example, it is known that bufotenidine causes paralysis. Uh, so the theory is that dephosphorylated eriginosin resembles bufotenidine in its action. I'm going to skip forward. Uh, so I'm going to illustrate. So this is bufotenin and this is bufotenidine. It has a trimethyl ammonium group here on this nitrogen. So ordinarily psilocybin is dephosphorylated to psilocin through uh, gut enzymes. So it removes this, this phosphate group here and it's replaced with a hydroxyl group. So the theory is that eriginosin, which looks like this, uh, has that tri-group on the nitrogen, uh, is dephosphorylated dephosph here. So replacing that phosphate group with the hydroxyl group. It has a structural sim similarity to the bufotenidine. Uh, so we think, so the idea is that the trimethyl ammonium is too large to have crossed the blood brain barrier and therefore affects muscle receptors, hence causing that physiological effect of, of paralysis. Uh, a colleague and I, uh, Simon Beck, um, have put together a survey. Um, if you would like to participate in it, we would really appreciate that. We would like to have some Americans participate. As we know, this is also a thing that happens with Solosophy Azurisans and Solosophy Zionisans and other wood lovers. Ian, could you copy and paste that into the, into the chat box? That'd be great, thanks. Uh, the law in Australia. All parts of psilocybe species, including the spores, are illegal at a federal level, so they're illegal to import. Uh, the whole um, spores for microscopy purposes in Australia is a myth. Of course, most people ignore this and, and spores come and go quite, quite often. Uh, psilocybin and psilocin are listed as Schedule 9 by the TGA, which I believe is equivalent to your Schedule 1 in the United States, for example. Um, the drug laws are individually governed by states and territories. So uh, sentencing, for example, it happens. And punishment happens at that level, not at a federal. Uh, psilocybin and psilocin are regarded, containing fungi are regarded as a preparation. So it's the interpretation of 
picking the mushroom itself has the intent of an illegal action. Uh, so, and in most laws, they're listed as psilocin, psilocybin. Okay. Could you actually and step fungi back? that contain? Yeah, certainly. Thank you for that. I just was not able to catch its full title. Uh, which slide? This slide? Uh, for, for the, yes, for the Psychedelic Society. Yes. Thank you. And I'll have that posted in the chat. You can go ahead and continue. Thank you for that. Cool. Uh, as an aside, uh, there is a really lovely documentary. Oh, I don't know if it's really lovely. It's kind of a bit concerning in some aspects. Uh, Fungimentary, The Magic Mushrooms of Ballingup can be found via YouTube. Uh, it's based in a little town in WA called Ballingup. It's, it's a good documentary to watch. Uh, okay, let's skip on to psilocybes of New Zealand. Uh, so this is the list of species. So psilocybe, wiraroa, uh, macarore, Aucklandiae, angulospora, Tasmaniana, Seberginosa, and Semilanciata. Uh, this is New Zealand climate environment. As you can see from this chart here, uh, it's mostly temperate uh, with no dry season and a warm summer. Uh, as the further south you go, it starts to drop into cold summers. Uh, most of the forest of what remains uh, is temperate broadleaf mixed forest uh, or beach, southern beach forest. And this is just a quick example of beach forest. Uh, so Psilocybe wiraroa, originally known as wiraroa Nova zelandia. Uh, it is a Sicotioid fungi. So the whole mushroom is like a little ball essentially on a stem. So its habitat is decaying wood in forest leaf litter, uh, growing off litter from Melocytus ramiflorus or Caudaline australis. Sorry for the Latin. <laughs> uh, it's endemic to New Zealand and it's found on the North and South Islands. Its season is from April to August. Uh, so rather than a cap, we have a peridium. Uh, so this is three to five centimetres tall and 1.5 to three centimetres wide. So it's a regularly roundish to ovate, uh, elliptical or even depressed globose. The light brown when they're young became pale blue-grey, often showing blue or blue-green stains with age. Uh, and as they dry, they kind of dry to a dingy brown. The gleba, the contents of the of the peridium, a chocolate or sepia brown. So it's a chambered structure uh, with contorted gill-like structures. Uh, this this mushroom has lost the ability for basidiospory. Uh, most, lots of mushrooms will eject their spores at a very very high acceleration, uh, but psilocybe wiraroa has lost that ability. The stump or the stem. Uh, is up to four centimetres tall, it's hollow, whitish to blue grey and yellowish brown at the base. So here's an example. So we have the younger specimens uh, that are light brown and as they grow larger they become blue. Uh, we can see here the contents, the gleba, which, which have these kind of gill-like like structures. This is how they're found on the forest floor. These little kind of light blue balls. Here's a specimen with, a, with blue bruising. You can see it here and, and on here. Uh, and again, another example of one sliced open. Uh, the most amazing, unusual looking, looking things. So um, they seem to think that these have either evolved or uh, through uh, species selection um, through having wingless birds. So the wingless birds would um, pick at berries and, and fruits on the forest floor and would then also kind of confuse the wiraroa uh, as, as one of these berries or fruits and thus spreading the spores. Um, 
so this is Psilocybe macarore. Its habitat is rotting wood and twigs, so it's fairly specifically Nothophaga species, uh, and it's found in New Zealand. Uh, the cap is 1.5 to 3.5 centimetres, conic to campanulating, and in age broadly convex. It's yellowish to brown to orange brown. Uh, the margin is striate when moist, uh, bruising greenish blue when injured. The gills are attached to adnext, uh, pale greyish brown. The stem 30 to 60 millimetres long. Uh, they have a partial veil. Sometimes the remnants can be found along the cap margin when young. Uh, Solosui Auckland,ie uh, The habitat is soil rich in woody debris and litter uh, beneath Leptospermum species or Decridium species. So uh, essentially tea tree. The Leptospermum is tea tree. Uh, and they're also found below pines, so Pinus radiata, which is an introduced species into both Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so they're found in Auckland, New Zealand, a few other locations, and they have been found in New South Wales. The cap is 1.5 to 5.5 centimetres, uh, connect to umbernate, becoming nearly plain with age. Uh, the margin is straight, they can become upturned. Uh, and splitting in age. Dark brown to yellowish brown in colour, drying to pale yellowish brown. Uh, the attachment, gill attachment is adnate. Uh, the gills are greyish yellowish brown in colour and darker with maturity. The stem, 35 to 100 millimetres, covered with whitish silky fibrils uh, and a part, pa uh, partial veil that is poorly developed, that soon disappears. Uh, and here's another example of, of Auckland-EA with the gills uh, and the stem. Solosibi angulospora, its hab habitat is on heavily manicure, manicured soil, often found in potted plants. Uh, it's found in, in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, it's also been found in Taiwan and that's where the holotype was found. So the identification, the, Original description was based on a uh, specimen found in Taiwan. Uh, the cap is 0.8 to 2 centimetres wide. It's light brown to yellowish brown in colour. Uh, it has this acute papilla, very similar to uh, Semilanciata. Uh, and the surface is glabrous and slightly fibrous. Stem, uh, 4 to 6 centimetres, orange, white to grey. Surface is smooth. The gills are narrowly adnate uh, and they're violet brown in colour and brownish grey when younger. So, the law in New Zealand, excuse me, psilocybin and psilocin are listed as Class A drugs uh, and they're listed in the Misuse of Drugs Act 1975. Uh, Psilocybe species is included in the definition of prohibited plants, uh, which states that any fungus of the genera Conosibe, Paniolus, and Psilocybe from which a controlled drug can be produced or which contains, or which contains a controlled drug. Uh, I'm going to cover very briefly some Psilocybe curiosities from Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so this is Psilocybe zapotecum. Uh, it's not formally described yet and has no formal name. But it's essentially what we refer to it as on the forums here in Australia. Uh, and this is Psilocybe wereroa, the uh, sub -sicotioides. Uh So it's, or it's evolution in action. So it looks like a clustered wereroa. Uh, but as you can see, the, it's, it's open at the base. And here you can see what almost looks like a partial veil. It's almost like it kind of just wants to open. Really, really interesting uh, variation. 
Um, we're not sure if it's going to stay just a variation or if it will become a species in its own right. Uh, I'm going to briefly point out some Zolosophy lookalikes for those of you who want to go out hunting, having a look. Beware of Gallerina, Hyphaloma, Cortinarius, Oligota, uh, Prostrophaeria, Semiglobata, Gymnopilus, and Laradiomyces cerez. Uh, the Gallerinas and Cortinarius in particular are potentially deadly, so be careful when you're foraging. And here in this photograph, you can see uh, Siberiginosa right next to Laradiomyces cerez. So if you're foraging it's, and it's really dark, it easily gets confused and you might have an upset tummy. <laughs> a brief look at ge the genetics. Uh, so this paper is from the Borovica, this illustration is from the Borovica paper, Molecular Phylogeny of Psilocybe Cyanesins Complex, uh, with reference to position of the Sicotioid Varroa Novae Zeliandae. Um, and you can see here Azuricens, Seberiginosa, Varroa Cyanesins Australiana, which is kind of interesting, uh, and are all clustered together in the same group. Uh, through personal communication, I've kind of been told that Waroa and Seberiginosa are very, very closely related. So that's something very interesting. And uh, I guess it's a thing that comes up quite often is that uh, many researchers in Australia and New Zealand and amateur mycologists would really like to see this group, this wood loving group examined at a genetic level. Uh, to determine the relationships, uh, particularly potentially the evolutionary relationships and um, whether there are other species hiding within, particularly Seberiginosa. Uh, we also get Seberiginosa here in Australia that are very similar to the sub uh, in that it has a really kind of twisted margin it looks like it kind of wants to fold under and join. Anyway, time will tell. Uh, so thanks to the following. So thank you to TAM Integration and the Psilocybin Summit team for having me on board and for helping me get on. Uh, thank you to Ian. Uh, thank you to Tanner Coolhouse for your photos. They're amazing. Thank you to Simon Beck for working with me on the uh, wood lover paralysis survey. Your time actually did most of the work. So, uh, and then thank you to photo, other photo contributors, and thank you to Facebook group participants over the years and, and shroomery participants. My knowledge wouldn't be what it was without you. Uh, these are some useful Australian field guides. I am just going to skip over this. Uh, my favourite field guide personally is the. Field Guide to Australian Fungi by Bruce Fuhrer and Tasmanian Fungi by Gator and Kowski, both really beautiful books. Uh, and I'm going to briefly mention some Australian organisations and websites, um, particularly Entheogenesis Australis, which is a long time um, organisation here in Australia that has been having regular uh, symposiums and conferences. And I would suggest getting on the mailing list uh, as they're planning the next the next symposium of course it's been kind of held up by covid so hopefully we'll know more about that soon when the next symposium happens other organizations are prism psychedelic research in science and medicine the australian psychedelic society and my community applied Mycology. Uh, if you're interested in joining a forum there's the corollary as well amazing king could you do us a favor and maybe sit back on that page of book references for a second Certainly. Um, because that was actually one of the questions that somebody asked, um, is if there was any references that you might recommend, I'd like to give them a, a shout out. Um, Kaylee from Presno asked if there were any resources, books, websites, or links um, that they might be interested in as far as mycology. So this is something that's very pertinent to Australia. Um, were there any maybe universal guides that you might be interested in sharing? Universal guides? 
Uh, I threw out there like Paul Stamets books, um, like his, <laughs> because he's anything that he writes, I think is some of the best biological work out there. So. There's philosophy mushrooms of the world. Mm. I think is Stamets book. Sorry, you caught me out there. <laughs> it's okay. No, um, it's a good it's, question. It's a good, uni it's a good universal guide. Mm. Um, but I think some of the species have, there's new species, species have been combined. So like Seberiginosa has been made synonymous with Australiana and Eucalypta, for example. Um, yes. Um, other guides, uh, say like Rogers Mushrooms, which is an amazing UK-based guide. Uh, the um, Adobin uh, Mushroom Field Guide that was edited all... Oh, Oh, who? Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, these are resources. Call, that somebody call me could, out. Um, resources people could find probably um, maybe if they reached out to you on Gorilla Mycology, they could actually get some better answers. Absolutely. Yes, for sure. Message me on there. Instagram. I can on Instagram. Yes. Definitely help you out there. Uh, um, these are pretty much the main Australian field guides. There are others that are right. far more detailed, um, but in terms of backpack friendly ones, these are the ones. Um, so another question, uh, Melinda from Salinas, uh, would the slideshow be available afterwards? Would there be a way for people to maybe get that from you? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to share the slideshow, uh, either through TAM integration, or maybe I can talk to Entheogenesis Australis about hosting it on, on their website. And then, um, and so we could probably see a post about that maybe on your Instagram later if it ends up going up. Yep. Sure, absolutely. Um, so we had some questions that had come in during the talk. Um, so Chris had asked, uh, what's the most practical way to measure psilocybin and psilocin in materials? Does it widely in a single species? That it was a does. question. So, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with that endpoint. Yes, uh, some species are incredibly variable. Uh, I know from Psilocybe subaruginosa, for example, wild specimens are, are not as potent, but the specimens that come off wood chips are incredibly potent. Um, so Psilocybe spheroginosa is up there with azurecins. In fact, there's a paper that demonstrates that they're more potent. <laughs> so, I believe your double blind um, article also touches on that as well. Yes, yeah. They, they are two species to be very careful of in terms of potency. Um, but yeah, depending on the substrate, yeah. Uh, my findings are that essentially the the more dense the substrate, the more potent is the mushroom. So really, like wood chips, like uh, chipped eucalypt, for example, end up with very potent specimens. Um, in terms of actually finding out the potency, um, you, you would have to go to a lab. Yeah. I, I specifically do work with groups in this regard. If people are interested in, in looking into some of those questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I did join the Discord, um, but my information should be available as well if you'd like to reach out. Yeah, but, the, but that's a topic we would really like to do, cover here in Australia. But, you know, our laws kind of inhibit a lot of that research. Mm. I didn't on, say on where I academic. was located, but I'm, I am in Oakland right now. So that is one of the... the the spaces that has has a little bit more freedom in that regard. Yeah. Um, there was um, another question, if you don't mind. Um, Matthew yeah. wanted to ask, um, can you comment on indigenous use of psilocybin in Australia and or New Zealand? And if you can directly I, I maybe point to us to somebody that might be able to. I can't comment on traditional use in, in New Zealand, uh, but in Australia, they have not disclosed that knowledge. Mm. Uh, if it was used it's probably secret knowledge and you would have to be have been um, initiated into that knowledge uh, so we don't know if, if they used them we don't know if there was a taboo on them but it, it's something we'd like to know but we also respect their their culture and don't inquire too much um, so I think the question that next would be uh, a, another good question would be uh, Chris, Christina, would this information maybe be useful to participants in the United States? I think you did kind of touch on that, but was there anything else you'd like to say in that regard? Probably only in the sense that um, Seberiginosa is very closely related to azurescence and cyanescence. So when I talk about those species, there is there is a crossover. 
I haven't gone too much into the genetics of it. Mm. Uh, that's a whole talk within itself, I think, mm. and probably something to be teased out over time. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, so one of the questions, uh, Matt from Florida was asking, um, are all the psilocybe species that you've shown to be edible and of at least like relatively low toxicity in the sense that you might get like a tummy ache, but you won't really get poisoned from them? Uh, they're all active species. So other, other than like the Loratiomyces example, for example, uh, they're all edible active species. Some are stronger than others. Uh, again, it comes down to you know, doing that work to actually find out what is the constituents and, and how much they vary. Um, so one of the other questions you did touch on briefly, both in the talk and kind of in that last uh, statement that you just gave is, has there been genetics tests to see how similar Azure SNs and subaeruginosa are? Um, I kind of gave the response that there has been some barcoding work utilizing uh, genes that are typically associated with barcoding ITS um, and looking at those regions. But as far as like full genomic work, my understanding is it's still pretty much open field. Is that correct? The only full gen genome sequence is cyanesins at the moment. Uh, and, and there is a whole heap of conjecture about that as well, because apparently the gene flow in the United States is quite low. And apparently there is some mention that they're, they're possibly from the United, the, from Europe. Um, or who knows? <laughs> I mean, there's a heap of, there's a variety of theories out there. Uh, a lot there of are lots of, yeah, a lot of unknowns. There are people in the underground doing genetic work. Uh, it's just none of it's really got to academic levels just yet. Uh, you will find phylogenetic trees in some papers. Mm. Uh, so, for example, like the, uh, I think it was Alenii paper recently, or mm. not recently, a few years ago, uh, had a phylogenetic, phylogenetic tree. Uh, There's the Boro Vika paper, mm. um, but nothing else. Other than there is a there is a Facebook uh, group that does focus on phylogenetic sequencing. So if you're curious about that, maybe seek it out. I'm aware of uh, the counterculture labs in Oakland, um, who you, uh, Alan Rockefeller works with. Yes. I've, you've had a couple of his pictures in here. He's an amazing mycologist that travels the world, imaging and understanding uh, mycology. Um, and different mushrooms in different environments and does a lot of work teaching people how to do genetic sequencing as citizen scientists. Um, he I does. Recommend... He's an amazing chap. Yeah. Um, really so worth connecting with if, if you can. If you are interested in looking into those questions, that's definitely a place I would recommend. Um, could you maybe, Matt asked, uh, Matthew asked if you could maybe comment on the genesis of your passion for mycology? <laughs> uh, the genesis of my passion uh, began as a teenager. Uh, I was very interested in consciousness as a teenager and what it meant. And my parents had a copy of uh, The Teachings of Don Juan on the bookshelf. And I read it as a 14 year old and then again as a 16 year old. Mm -hmm. and I was fascinated by it. Um, and then so as a 17 year old, I guess my friends and I started looking and I guess that's where it started. <laughs> and one of the things that came up very quick, quickly was was getting the right mushroom so you know knowing what you're looking for before you actually start picking because uh, yeah we almost got hurt a couple of times so, doing the um, research and doing the the dry runs are important before you dive deep absolutely yep know what you're looking for before you start picking research yep um uh, another, oh, go ahead I was just going to say, there's so many amazing resources out there. It's not like when I started. I mean, 30 years ago, we didn't have the internet. So, you know, and trying to find a book on the subject was impossible. And if you did find an ID guide, generally the psilocybe picture was ripped out. <laughs> so uh, for me, a big turning point was finding a copy of Guzman's monograph. Uh, you know, that really was a turning point in, in my interest and my, my knowledge and understanding. Um, so two questions. Um, one, which university did you, uh, Matt, Matthew was asking, a different Matthew was asking, uh, which university you, did you complete your master's at? And do you know of any other Australian universities that have a specialty in mycology? 
mycology is a field in Australia that is poorly underrepresented. Um, if you want to get into mycology in Australia, you have to wait till you do post grad studies. So, um, so honours year, for example, um, or or masters. So you need to kind of set yourself up to then be able to get appropriate supervisors. Uh, so, for example, I did plant science. I did plant science, microbiology, and chemistry for my majors and minors in my degree. Um, and then I did my masters at the University of Melbourne. So, and my supervisor was was Tom May, who was one of Australia's leading mycologists, if not the leading mycologist. <laughs> So that was I very privileged. So uh, another question that had come up in the chat from Vina: um, Can wood paralysis stop breathing? That's a good question. I have heard of people having breathing difficulties from wood loving paralysis. Yeah, so it's definitely something to be aware of, um, and hence why Simon and I, for example, have this strong interest in trying to work out. Mm do or well, my particular interest is is um it does the substrate affect the alkaloids hmm. within the mushrooms um and then yeah and then, so it's like a specific wood chip that it's growing on as like eucalyptus as compared well, to something else or some other soil that it's growing well we on. don't we don't know but i'm kind of curious whether it is the substrate that does Mm. Pretend it affect the levels of alkaloids that become problematic mm. uh, because some patches consistently produce the effect. Mm. Uh, but the effect also comes down to the individual. Mm. Um, I know of people who have all had doses from the same patch, mm -hmm. uh, and only one person from that patch suffered from the paralysis, mm. whereas everybody else was fine. So it's it's a bit here and there and you know essentially there needs to be a lot more research onto this topic absolutely uh, and, and given that it's uh our, our main species here in southeast australia is sabera canosa it, it's something that we would like to get a handle on for for harm reduction um educating as people as it stands, uh, we only have a, maybe about three more minutes. Um, was there any other last points you would like to make or any other last questions, uh, anybody that you would like to ask? I see Jeffrey Lawler has their hand raised. Um, I don't know if you had the ability to chat. I see Deborah Rose. Um, I'm going to go ahead and see if I can't give Jeffrey a question to ask his question, an uh, opportunity to ask his question, if you're okay with that, Kane. Mm. Go for it. Let's see if we can make that work. And I will unmute. You must unmute yourself, Jeffrey, if you'd like to try to ask your question. Let's see if it'll work. Can I unmute you, maybe? I've I can unmute un you, Jeffrey. I tried unmuting, oh. it won't let you. Yeah, no, it's not letting me. That's fair. Um, well, hang on, so try. where is... Uh, have you put your question in the chat box? No, I haven't seen a question just yet. So I, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give this one more try. Um, Aaron Jacobs, I will give a try just to see if we can get that to work. You should be available to maybe unmute. No. Nope. Not, Maybe not I, I thought I would try. I, I would try just to see if we could make it work. Um, again, I am trying my best to make sure anybody puts their questions in both chat or the question box, I will try to get answered. We do have maybe a time for one more question. Um, you can reach out to Kane again via Instagram. That's probably the best way to find him, Gorilla Mycology, um, at Gorilla Mycology. Um, yep. Are there any, feel, from Sheila. Feel free to send messages and ask questions. Um, are there any concerns related to mushrooms and climate changes? I think that's a good way to kind of maybe stop things right there. Mm, mushrooms and climate change. Um, I think as, well, particularly for Australia, I think as things get warmer, uh, it probably will affect some of the cold loving species. So 
you know, you'll find that that, that margin of fruiting will become shorter. Uh, we recently had some very, very dry periods here in Australia over the last 10 years. Uh, and the season was almost to the end of April through to July. So with, with not many people being able to pick. Uh, for the more tropical species, I think they'll probably be, be fine. So, you know, as the tropics kind of get a little bit wetter. Um, but yeah, no, as, as things dry out in some of the southern states for us, it, it could become a problem. Fair enough. Again, the, I guess the extension of that Mediterranean zone that we have here in Australia. Maybe expand the region. Hopefully there's a better expanse for these things in the, if the world does change in those ways. Kane, thank you again for your time. Um, thank you all for attending. Uh, we'd like to honor every one of you here today. Thank you very much for coming with us. We have another amazing talk. Uh, Mama Ayana is going to be closing out our day. So feel free to come back in 15 minutes and see her. Awesome. Thank, Kane, thank, thank you, you everybody for coming along and joining in and, um, and for watching. And for those who are watching later, and I hope you enjoy the talk. Uh, and thank you, Ian, for moderating and it's been a pleasure. Much appreciated. See y'all soon. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you.